Welcome to Corporate Competitor Podcast. The premise of this show is to learn how sports shaped today's business icons. And today, in celebration of 200 episodes published, we are rewinding back to one of my favorite conversations from 2022, my interview with Dr. Condoleezza Rice. You may know her as the former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, but did you know that Dr. Rice was also the first woman to serve on the college football playoff committee? Her love for the game of football started young, thanks to her father, who was a football coach. He taught her to break down defenses at just six years old. <laughs> in addition to her political achievements, she became one of the first two women invited to join Augusta National Golf Club. Now, as director of Stanford's Hoover Institution, Dr. Rice continues to inspire future leaders with the lessons from her extraordinary career. Enjoy this Rewind episode, and as always, you can download my notes from the episode at corporatecompetitorpodcast.com slash notes. I did win the NFL football pool. That gave us something to talk about on Monday morning. Why were the Packers so flat? Or did you see the Cowboys play? It was a kind of bridging language. And we spend a lot of time these days talking about diversity and inclusion. I tell people who are different, if you're the different one, you can bridge back to others as well. They don't have to quote, make you comfortable. You can bridge back to them. And in settings, if you need to break the ice a little bit, sports is really a great way. Dr. Rice, thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to join you. And please, please call me Condi. Dr. Rice is my father, so call me Condi. I will do that, but I'm always respectful because <laughs> what you've accomplished in life is the stuff of legend. But I had the pleasure of speaking with you for a Sports Illustrated article many years ago. Back in 2004, I was invited to interview you about your college football season predictions. Crazy thing to talk to someone of your significance about, but the president believed that I should ask you those questions. And when we published the piece on one side of the two-page spread, you made your picks. And on the other page was some guy named James Carville. <laughs> Right. And at the end of the season, we actually noted in Sports Illustrated that you were far more accurate. Yeah. We're going to avoid the trash talk. But when you're looking at great teams, when you're thinking at the beginning of a season, here's what I think can be exceptional. What kind of things are you looking for? You know, this has changed a bit because in the interim, I served for three years on the college football playoff committee. So you see things differently. Right. And I have to admit, I see things differently sitting in the room with great coaches like Ty Willingham and Tom Osborne and Barry Alvarez. You get a sense of how to look at teams a little bit differently. So I'm enjoying it even more these days. But I always look first and foremost for whether the team has an identity. Mm. Is there something that they can go to? when they're down by 14 and a half? Is there something that they're going to establish early on? Because if they're constantly trying to be something that they're not, the personnel doesn't match up with what they're doing, then they're not going to be very successful. Teams that have an identity are the teams that are most successful. That's also true of organizations, particularly the larger they are. If they don't have an identity, then the harder it is for people to understand the culture, what's expected, and it's especially important when things are going badly. Secondly, are there leaders on their team who can bring out the best in others? I don't just mean the loudest guy on the team. Sometimes we associate leadership with just being loud. But really, it's who has the respect, who would never ask things of somebody that they haven't asked of themselves, who gets to the film room ahead of everybody else and stays longer than anybody else. And it's one reason that young teams, it's kind of hard for them because they haven't really established that who's the leader. And it's not always the quarterback. Right. And my favorite team, the Cleveland Browns, Miles Garrett is really the essence of that team. Yes. And he, maybe more than anybody, has sort of changed the Cleveland Browns in the way that they think about themselves. And then finally, who did you play? Right. Have you subjected yourself to the toughest possible competition or are you running up points on inferior competition for organizations, for corporations, for universities, and by the way, for individuals? 
you have to constantly be measuring yourself against the best. What does the Navy SEAL say? A players want to play with A players. B players want to play with C players. Right. I love that idea about team identity. What's interesting is how often a really good team, a really good leader will shift that based on the talent that they have around them. Absolutely. Because whatever you're going to do, it has to match with the capabilities that are there. I think it was Don Rumsfeld who once said, you know, I have to go with the army that I have. Right. You can't go with the team or the organization that you wish you had or that you would like to have. You have to go with the team that you have. And of course, the best organizations ultimately recruit to that identity. But it's really important that capabilities and expectations and what you're trying to do match up. I love it. You know, growing up, your father, Dr. John Wesley Rice Jr., coached high school football in Birmingham. And every week, you and your dad would watch your beloved Cleveland Browns and the Alabama Crimson Tide. Yes. You both also, in the summers, would race to the store to grab Street and Smith's Pro Sports Football Report so you could analyze offenses and defenses together. Is there a memory you have with your father of thinking through teams and what they might be capable of being? Oh, absolutely. And we would go through it page by page and we'd look at every team. My dad was an offensive lineman. He would say, watch the offensive line. And his view was that the most important down was actually second down. He always thought, yeah, first down's important. But if you haven't gotten yourself to third and one, third and two, because he was basically a three yards in a cloud of dust kind of guy. And I, too, prefer teams that really can run the ball. So when I'm looking for a team, I'm looking for a team that can control the line of scrimmage by running the ball. When I was on the committee, we had every statistic known to humankind at our disposal. I can imagine. But football is actually kind of a game of dominance. And it's not always time of possession. I think that's a kind of false stat sometimes. I remember the old Cincinnati Bengals of the early 1980s. Boomer Esiason. And- right. Max Montoya. Oh, yeah. And Anthony Munoz. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It was eight yards and four yards and 12 yards on the ground. And they would go into what they call their attack huddle. They never had much time of possession because they were just plowing down the field. So... I'm really a line of scrimmage kind of person who's dominating that line of scrimmage. That's what I want to see. There was one amendment to that, and it was my good friend, Bill Walsh. Oh, my gosh. You know, the West Coast offense was kind of a running game that looked like short passes. (laughs) So that was probably the one exception to my dominate the line of scrimmage rule. Yeah. But I think the most exciting analysis that we ever did was when the first Super Bowl called the World Championship, I think, originally uh, between the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs. Neither of those was particularly our team, by the way. I was not a great fan of the Green Bay Packers, although I really respected Vince Lombardi. And we sat there and we analyzed and we analyzed. Interestingly, my father thought the Chiefs had a chance. And of course, they would go on to defeat the Vikings a couple of years later and really set off then the merger of the then two distinct leagues. We just thought that Max McGee was going to have a big game for the Green Bay Packers. And who knew he did. That was one of my really great memories was watching that first Super Bowl with my dad. I love it. You did an interview with Forbes a number of years ago, in which you talked about when you were a young fellow with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, your first year there, you noted that you became more respected by your peers After a particular week in the football pool, yeah, you dominated everybody else, but you had this great line, football is a language that transcends gender. Can you elaborate more on that story and tell us how your interest in sports has allowed you to enter conversations or be even in places that you might not otherwise have been? Sure. Well, at the age of 30, I had this fellowship to worked for the George Chiefs of Staff, and I worked for the division that did strategic nuclear planning. They were the guys who wrote the single integrated operations plan for the employment of nuclear weapons. They were kind of serious people. (laughs) Yeah, I was three things they'd never seen, female, black, and civilian. The first day they said, the rookie makes the coffee. And I could have gotten all huffy about it and said, I'm a Stanford faculty member. I don't make coffee, but I made the coffee. Truth is, I make coffee so strong, nobody can 
drink it. So <laughs> it asked me to do that again. But the very next week I did in September win the NFL football pool. And that gave us something to talk about on Monday morning. You know, why were the Packers so flat? Or did you see the Cowboys play? They never seemed to be in playoff position and et cetera, et cetera. It was a kind of bridging language. And we spend a lot of time these days talking about diversity and inclusion. Those are really important concepts. But I tell people who are different, if you're the different one, you can bridge back to others as well. They don't have to, quote, make you comfortable. You can bridge back to them. And in settings, if you need to break the ice a little bit, sports is really a great way to break the ice. It is that bridge. You're not kidding. Your knowledge of this wasn't just the casual bridge. You're so good at it and knowledgeable that they did invite you to join the initial college football playoff committee. 13 people deciding who gets to play for the national championship. And you mentioned earlier that you suddenly had a new perspective. Do you mind sharing a little bit about how being in rooms like that changed a little bit about how you would see sports and maybe even some of the applications that you learned out of that? Well, I'd always been analytical about the game, you know, at six years old. Oh, what are they doing? Kindly? So, oh, daddy, that's a trap block or, you know, oh, or they're setting up a screen, daddy. So I knew the game in that way. But that was a committee that for me, it was a trust because we were about to realize the dreams, I think, of every college football fan going back for decades. I've described how outraged my father was when a man that I would come to love when I went to Notre Dame, but when Eric Parsian went for the tie in that 66 game against Michigan State and Alabama gets shunted aside, Notre Dame wins the national championship. I remember my father just slamming down something and saying, we need a playoff. Wow. So I felt that I was kind of somehow asserting that those fans who had wanted a playoff, I had their responsibility in my hands. So I thought it was a very serious matter. It was a committee that worked really, really hard. You would go through the statistics and watch the games. I watched 12 games every Saturday. I watched another seven or eight on what's called coaches tape, the 45 minutes cut down. And then we would get on a plane on Monday, go to Dallas and debate. In those debates, I was somebody who understood and kind of loved the statistics. And there were a couple of others like that. But the coach's eye I just came to be so respectful of the coach's eye. They just saw little nuances that were hard for me to see. And as they began to point them out, I started to look for them too. Small things like uh, how hard are they having to work against that pass rush? You know, are they having to chip the pass rusher? Are they having to double team the pass rusher? Is that opening up other avenues for the offense? I told Barry Alvarez, who became one of my great buddies on the committee, I said, you know, Barry, you're what my father would have called a football man, which was the highest praise he could give anybody. Learning from those coaches, I do now watch the game very differently. And I guess maybe just watching so many games, I see penalties before they are called, that kind of thing. So it's really fun. You know, my mother was a musician. It was music with my mom. It was sports with my dad. I will tell you this, though. My mother got tired of being left out on Sundays when we were in there watching the NFL. So she came in one day and she said, OK, I'm going to pick a team. I'm taking them. I like their colors. 1972 Miami Dolphins. <laughs> I like their colors. <laughs> Every Sunday she would come in and she'd say, did they win? We'd say, yes. Did they win? Yes. And then from that time on, she was a captured football fan, too. And so we would watch the games, not just with my dad, but my mom would also chime in. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of teams that would hate it. that They got picked for the colors. (laughs) So I've never been in one of those rooms. Very few of us have in the world. But when you listen to the Monday morning quarterbacking after the conversations that you have, there seems to be some negotiation. Was there anything about the way people convinced each other that might be a lesson we could learn from that time? Well, let me say first that we had to get to consensus. So it's like jury voting. You have to talk about it. And if people have different views, you know, sometimes it was really obvious, but a lot of the time it really wasn't very obvious. The great thing is people would make their arguments. It was intense. It was never mean spirited. 
And I kind of got a reputation of helping people to see what the other person was saying, because that's what I did as a diplomat. (laughs) (laughs) You're playing diplomacy in the CFP room. Exactly. You have to kind of listen to everybody and try to figure out where the interest overlap is between what appear to be irreconcilable views. So I would sort of say, well, I was hearing Barry say this, and I thought I heard Tom say that, you know, is it possible that this? And so I found myself being the diplomat in the room to help people figure out what was really being said. And you realize that if you're going to play the role of bringing people together, bridging differences, you have to take your own ego aside for a bit and say, all right, I'm not going to try to impose my views here. My role here is to listen very carefully to everybody and to see if I can hear things that might suggest that there are common beliefs here or common ways of seeing this that aren't being recognized. Because sometimes a disagreement is just a disagreement. But sometimes a disagreement is because people are talking past each other, Mm. not just in that football room. But when I was doing diplomacy, you know, the American Secretary of State walks in and Everybody wants to hear what the American Secretary of State is going to say. That's been true since the end of World War II. And I'm sure Tony Blinken would tell you that that's the case today. But sometimes it's better for the American Secretary of State to sit back, hear what others are thinking, because once the American Secretary of State has spoken, everybody's reacting to that, not really putting forward their true views. In whatever room I've been in, including when I was in the football committee, It was to try to put my own views in the background for a little bit and hear what people were saying and see if I could help people to see that they might even be saying much the same thing. So just sit back and listen for a while. We had a structure, and I think they still do, where each member followed one Power Five team and one Group of Five team in pairs. The first year, for instance, I had the Big Ten and I had Conference USA. So you were responsible first and foremost for making sure that the reporting took place on every game that was relevant in those conferences. It meant that you really had to kind of do your homework and you watched a lot of games that you probably would not have otherwise watched. And one year I had the Big 12. That was not the Big 12 of today. That was the Big 12 where it was kind of a video game. Basketball on grass. Exactly. Where you put all your best players on offense and then these poor defensive backs are back there kind of waving their arms. (laughs) So when I would report on the Big 12 and the numbers were so big and the yardage was so big, we would have to go to the comparative perspective to look at why this might be happening. So I learned to look at games that way too, not just who's winning, but why are they winning and why are they scoring so much? And that's been really interesting. And I've continued to look at games that way. I love it. You know, you mentioned the need for diplomacy in meetings. And I love the way you put that. Sometimes it's hearing what people are saying and presenting it with a new set of words. You're saying the same thing, but they might hear it differently. Yep. And maybe from a new voice helps as well. I love that. But listening was the thing that really stood out to me. I am assume that you're a world-class listener. I sure try to be. I sure try to be. And I try to get my students to be good listeners too. Sometimes, particularly with young college students, they want to raise their hand quickly and fast. And I say, you know, I haven't even finished the question, but you just, you know, it is a lost art. Isn't it? You know, not only did you grow up watching and analyzing football, but you're also a competitor in your own sport. From the age of six, you took the ice to compete in figure skating. Yep. You're our first figure skater on the podcast. (laughs) But competing can teach us a lot of things, including how to manage failure. And in an article, you actually described yourself as terrible at skating. That was your word. Yeah. Despite spending years waking up at 430, putting in the work. Can you share what lessons you learned from not just watching, but your participation in athletics? Well, I'm not being facetious. The first lesson I learned is pick the right sport. I'm five foot eight. I've got five foot 10 legs. Figure skating wasn't the right sport. (laughs) And I can remember all the judges whenever I would skate saying, you need a soft knee. Don't you think I'm trying to bend my knees? It just doesn't work for me. And, And many years later, when I picked up a tennis racket for the first time, I thought, oh, that was my sport. So the first clue is pick the right sport. Pick the right sport. But then if you find that you just love the sport, which is what happened to me with skating and I would work very, very hard at it. And 
I'd have occasionally good performances, but more often than not, something that was for me disappointing. The great lesson is you have to get up the next day and try again. You have to keep going. It's a little bit like life. You can't let a bad outcome just defeat you for all time. When I watch the best athletes who are very, very good at their sport, they're able to put behind them the bad performance or the bad play and move on. And I I watch a lot of college sports in particular, because here at Stanford, we have an outstanding program. I just love watching the way that whatever happens, they're back there the next day practicing and at it again. The other thing it teaches you is time management and discipline. I was also a pianist, so I had to find time for practicing the piano and performing there and skating and school. My father, when I was an adult, he said to me, you're almost as busy now as when you were a teenager, because it was always some activity. So I learned to manage my time. And again, with college athletes, I very often find that they are the best time managers on campus because they have to get it all done. And then the final thing is that you can't just keep doing things that are easy for you. Mm. Now, I'm learning this the hard way in golf these days because I'm really good off the tee. I'm long. I love to hit the ball off the tee. It was the first time I hit a driver that I realized was going to love golf. And I'm a really good putter. Everything in between is kind of an adventure. So I've had to really spend time working on my irons. I've had to spend time working on my short game, which used to be a liability. It's still not an asset, but it's not a liability anymore. And so you learn that to be a complete athlete, you have to work on the things that you're not good at doing. We all as human beings love to do the things that we're good at doing because it feels good and it's fulfilling, but you have to identify the things that you're not good at and work harder on those than the things that you're good at doing. So what was the key? What did you do to make that short game get better? (laughs) Practice. Just repetition? Just repetition. And I have a couple of friends who have really good short games and I go and play little matches against them. After a while, you get tired of losing to your friends. So then you go out and get better. (laughs) I like it. Good. We got a real competitor here. You know, I love the way you came to pick up golf. I read a story in USGA Golf Journal about how you picked up the game. Would you share it? Sure. I had never wanted to play golf. I was a figure skater and then I was a tennis player. I thought golf was boring. And four hours. Oh my gosh. And four hours of chasing a little white ball. Who wants to do that? I went on vacation to the Greenbrier the summer after I became Secretary of State with my cousin and some other ladies. And my cousin's husband was a golfer and he gave her golf lessons at the camp at the Greenbrier. And he gave me buddy lessons so she would go. Sure enough, the first day it was hit seven iron, seven iron, seven iron. I thought, yep, this is every bit as boring as I thought. And then the next day they let us hit a driver. All of a sudden I was in love. I went back to DC. Now I was secretary of state. I have no time, but I went out to Andrews Air Force Base where they had golf courses. And I said to the pro, a man named Alan Burton, I said, you're going to have to teach me this on the course because I don't have time to go to a range. The good thing is when you're secretary of state, they shut down the six holes in front of you and six holes behind you <laughs> on an Air Force Base. You get Secret Service running. They'll chase your ball down for chase you. Chase your ball down for you. But the best thing was my security detail was really comfortable because I was on an Air Force Base. So unlike normal life, when you're secretary of state where there's security people on top of you, you don't ever walk very far. You get right into your car and right into the building. I loved being outside, walking, and going to find my ball in the bushes. It was liberating. It became, for me, a really transporting experience where I could get away from everything else. I knew that if I could just get the ball going forward, I was eventually going to move back to California, where the Stanford golf course is five minutes from my house, and I could take it up seriously. They've had a few amazing players on that course. They've had a few amazing players. The great Tiger Woods. Yes. The great Tom Watson. Great Sandy Tatum. Yep. And by the way, we continue to have great players in our women's teams, which won the title in 2015. Both the teams look really good, but the women look really strong this year. Wow. I love it. You know, for a sport that you picked up so late, I mean, you became quite an important figure. In 2012, you became one of the first two women to be invited to join Augusta. 
did you have any aspiration to want to go join Augusta or did it just, I mean, how does a phone call like that come to be? I say all the time that people who became first weren't setting out to be first. Right. <laughs> I had been to Augusta with George Schultz well before I could play Augusta because I could barely keep the ball in the air those days. But I love the place. I love the tradition of it. Now, I love our institutions that are timeless in some ways, but able to change. Lee Steisinger, who I've known in Birmingham, actually came out and he asked to see me for just a few minutes. And I said, so Lee, why are you here? And he said, well, I'm here because we'd like you to become a member of Augusta National. And I was just got, I didn't, couldn't say a word. <laughs> After a little while, he said, uh, you are going to say yes, right? <laughs> and I said, sure. <laughs> it's been the most wonderful experience for all kinds of reasons, including Augusta's dedication to changing the game, changing the face of the game, changing access to the game, everything from sponsoring the amateurs for Latin America and for Asia, through which Matsuyama becomes a great figure. Right. The women's amateur now, which is just a thrill to watch the best amateurs play on that course. And then the drive, chip, and putt, which is in some ways my favorite. These kids who come, a couple of them have been very successful. As they've begun to grow up, I get texts from from time to time saying, do you remember me? You greeted me on the 18th green when I was 11. So I think Augusta has done a lot for the game and continues to do a lot for the game. Which is so amazing, isn't it? Because for so many years, people considered it the stick in the mud place. So, I mean, the idea that it's, progressing and that you're able to kind of have a front row seat and be engaged in those conversations. I think that's enormously powerful. It's funny. One of the advantages of being a member there at Augusta is in a master's week, there's a day, I think it's the Sunday before where you get to play with one of the pros who will be competing that week. And I just finished writing a book with Bubba Watson. We actually had him on one of the podcasts and he says, there's nobody he enjoys the experience more with than you. I think you and Lee, Bubba and Bubba's wife play. Yeah, He's a quirky soul. <laughs> I can say that. No one love him as you do. But is there something you've learned playing with a guy like Bubba Watson? Well, I think it won't surprise me. The creativity is off the charts. He just sees things that nobody sees. It's actually made me want to be a little more creative with my game. So if you are behind a tree, Maybe you don't have to just chip it out, you know? Maybe there's some way to turn it around. I kind of, from time to time, will bring my inner Bubba out <laughs> or my other great friend, Phil, my inner Phil, you know, and kind of go for it. He has a marvelous creative eye, but he's also so competitive. Even when he's playing with Lee against me and Angie, his wife, he really wants to win. At Augusta, when we were playing on number four, which is a really long par three, I hit maybe the best shot I've ever hit on that hole. And I was within four feet for birdie. Bubba gets up and hits it to three. And I thought, <laughs> you just had to do that, right? You just had to do that. But he's a wonderful spiritual person. Yes, he is. Greatly religious person. Wonderful family person. Talks a lot about his kids. And he and Angie just have a wonderful relationship, wonderful marriage. She's really good for him. He's good for her. And I think they recognize it. She's a great athlete, by the way. Oh, WNBA player. Yeah. So it's fun to play with Angie, too. She's the athletic part of our team. She's the athletic part of his family. I tell him that. Yeah. All he's, just, <laughs> he's just a golfer. Yes. But your father, very accomplished in his life. Not only was he a football coach, but he was a three-sport athlete in college, a minister, a teacher, even the dean of students at Stillman. What did you learn about leadership from him? My parents really taught me that it's great to have talents and gifts and resources, but if you're not reaching across and giving back, then it's not working. And, you know, they were also religious and believed that it was a part of our religious obligation as well. My dad was somebody who really sought out people that he thought he could help. And that he thought had leadership characteristics. You know, segregated Birmingham was not an easy place to be a teenager. I mm. was younger in segregated Birmingham, but my father had this youth fellowship at his church. 
kids would come from all over the city, not just kids who were part of his church, but from other places. He used to joke and say it was because he could have dances and the Baptists couldn't, but he would bring all these kids on Sunday afternoons and just give them experience after experience after experience, take them to Stillman College in Tuscaloosa to stay for a week so they knew what it was like to be on a college campus. One of the most remarkable things that he did was there was a temple and he became friendly with this rabbi and he wanted them to understand Judaism. Wow. So he took them over to talk to the rabbi about Judaism. Long before segregation ended, the minister of Shades Valley Presbyterian, which was white and his church, which was black, decided to get the kids together. So he was pretty revolutionary in the way that he dealt with limited circumstances. But he never forgot the importance of education. And to him, his job was to educate. And I've learned that if you're going to be a leader, you have to decide what's your best way to intervene in other people's lives. I follow him and my mother as well. Education for me and being an educator, with all the jobs I've had, I define myself first and foremost as an educator. Wow. I had a chance to work with John Wood many years ago, and he never called himself a coach. He said, I just want to be known as a teacher. He always called it the most honorable profession. But what I love listening to you talk about your father there, you've talked about bridging language. He went beyond language. He went to bridging exercises, if you would. And in this day and age, boy, do we need more dialogue and bridging opportunities. Yes. How powerful. Right. Well, he was determined not to let the circumstances dictate the outcomes, so to speak. Mm. And he bridged uh, across racial lines. He also bridged across socioeconomic lines. His church, Westminster Presbyterian, and he was a, by this time, guidance counselor at Ullman High School. My mom was a teacher in the city and all of their, our little community, I think everybody taught school with the exception of one lawyer, one doctor, everybody else taught school. His church was like that. They were all educated people. Behind the church, there was a government project called Loveland's Village. Very low socioeconomic status, not many options. And my dad would have on Tuesday nights tutors come in to tutor kids in algebra or chemistry. He would have the dentist come to the church on Wednesday to do free dental work. He would have the kids from Loveman's Village come for a Thanksgiving basket. And he got some criticism about it, by the way, from his church, because they kind of liked their status in Birmingham. And here he was breaking down those barriers of status. And I should just say one thing. My mother was much the same way. She taught in one of the toughest districts in the city, Inslee, which was out by the steel mills. She used to say, those kids deserve the best, too. Oh, by the way, I should mention... My mother's student was Willie Mays. What? Your mother taught Willie Mays? My mother taught him English in ninth grade. I saw Willie Mays at a baseball game. And I said to him, do you remember by any chance my mother? And he said, well, what was your mother's name? And I said, well, it would have been Angelina Ray. He's, oh, yes, I remember Miss Ray. She told me, son, you're going to be a ball player. If you need to leave a little early, you go ahead and do it. And I said, it doesn't sound quite like my mother, but it's a great story. So I'll go with it. <laughs> she wouldn't let you no, off. Oh, no. That's funny. You know, a lot of people in corporate, political, whatever environment, they refer to their organization as a team, even though it's frankly just a bunch of independent contractors all carrying the same business card. Teams, I think, is one of those overused monikers, but you know what it's like to be part of a team, both in a political circle and other environments, what elements would you coach a leader who's trying to build a team to try to get that collection of individuals to give of themselves and become a team? What way would you coach somebody to be better in that area? Well, I think teams are built from the bottom up, not from the top down. Mm. Really, what you're trying to do is to build a cohesive unit in which everybody's skills, everybody's capabilities are used to their maximum. So not everybody's going to be good at everything. And part of a team is to figure out how to get the best out of everybody. If everybody were an offensive lineman on a football team, it wouldn't work very well. So you're trying to bring different skill sets together in order to get a cohesive group that can then achieve. And you have to very carefully 
make sure that people are bringing different skill sets and that they're meshing and that everybody's respected for what they do. You know, another thing I like about sports is nobody's going to say to the offensive lineman, well, you just block. That's not really important. I throw the ball. Well, yeah, try throwing the ball if the offensive lineman doesn't block. With Miles Garrett breathing in your neck. Exactly. Miles Garrett's going to be sitting in your living room. The key is that everybody has to have their contribution and everybody has to respect everybody else's contribution. When you look at something like special forces, I've spent a lot of time with special forces guys. They will tell you that they just have to be able to trust that that person next to them is going to do his job. They can't try to do that person's job. And the way that you do it is you practice, you gain confidence, each other, you gain trust in each other. And the final thing is you don't gossip about one another. Mm. First thing is don't do it yourself. <laughs> so Amen. rule number one. And then if you hear it, I think it's very important to say to somebody, have you talked with, you know, Annie about it? Does Josh know that you feel that way? Get people to understand that gossip for the sake of gossip is corrosive. If you really do have something that you think somebody isn't doing well, or you need more from that person, then go have that conversation with that person. If you need me to facilitate, I'm happy to do that. But I'd really rather the two of you work it out person to person first. And then if we need to do something more, we'll do it. But transparency is an overused word too, but it is pretty important that people don't feel that something's being kept from them, particularly about their own performance. See, very often somebody knows they're not performing very well. Yes. And as a leader, you can say to them, oh, well, let's talk about how we can make you more successful. I was a very young provost. I was 38 years old when I became provost. Wow. I'd never been a dean. I'd never been a department chief even. And the Stanford provost is a very powerful provost. It's the chief operating officer of the university. And I would ask somebody to get something done and then it wouldn't get done. And immediately I would think, well, it was passive aggressive. They didn't want to do it. So they weren't doing it. Sometimes they have no earthly idea how to get it done. The first thing that can break a team apart more quickly than anything else is when people are constantly whispering about one another or talking down about somebody behind their back. They talk in sports about losing the locker room. I think that's really what they mean. If you want to be critical of somebody, be critical to their face. Don't hide in the shadows and do it and then work it out. If you can't do that, then the team is going to implode eventually. I had a chance to work with the All Blacks, the rugby team in New Zealand a few years ago. And that's one of their core principles is stab me in the front, not the back. Absolutely. I remember the first time I heard it, I thought, oh my gosh, like stab me in the front. It sounds <laughs> overly dramatic, but then you understand what they're really. What they're saying, yes. Yeah. Connie, mm-hmm. thank you so much. I learned the first time I had the chance to talk to you how if I would just sit back and listen, how much I could absorb and I did it again here. I'm grateful to you. Thank you for your service and for all that you've done for our country. But beyond that, thank you today for being a corporate competitor. Thanks very much. It was great to be with you. You have a great show. And that was a wonderful interview. It really was one of the really fun ones I've done. Really different. It was great. Good to see you again. Oh, my gosh. What a wonderful interview. I took so many notes and there's just so much energy in that conversation. I'm so grateful to uh, my good friend, Condi. Right off the bat, does the team have an identity? That's a great question for us. Does our team have an identity? Do we know what it is we stand for, what people should expect and what they can count on from us? Because that's what identity really is. It is something that everybody knows they're going to get when they face you. The second one was when she talked about the importance of building bridging language into conversations, actually asking and even building out ways that she could help people understand each other in a room as impactful as the college football playoff committee. And then finally, my third major takeaway was when we talked about teams, how to build a great team. And she said, don't allow your team to gossip about one another. And if someone's doing it, call them out for them, put two people together so that it gets right because it's such a corrosive force within so many organizations. Gossip breaks it down. You start by not being the one to gossip. And you carry it forward by not allowing it to happen. What great insight and and the, the kinds of words that you can get once in an interview. 
And today we got it. I hope you enjoyed learning as much as I did. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. Feedback helps us spread the insights of our guests to a wider audience. It actually increases our ratings. Thank you so much for those who have done so in the past. And catch new episodes every Wednesday. Subscribe at corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to be the first to get a chance to listen. And as a thank you gift, I will send you a chapter from one of my best-selling books. Stay connected with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. My handle is at Don Yeager, D-O-N-Y-A-E-G-E-R. And until next week, I appreciate you.